Volleyball. 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 All right. So, bro, news. Let's get it kicking. Let's right. get it whipping. Right. So, we kind of teed it up, right? There's always often these different happenings happening, happening, happening. What is happening? I'm very confused. What is happening? Why are they leaving? What is happening here? Let me clear. What is happening? I'm sorry. What is happening? What's happening? What is happening here? Why are you taping them? What is happening here? What's happening? What is happening? In the craft beer industry, and because it is about economy, finance, that's our theme for today. It's not all doom and gloom either, right? We got to look at the silver lining of things. We're going to highlight some acquisitions happening, but we're also going to highlight those exits that are happening because honestly, they just, it's just too funny of a timeline not to mention. So... Looking forward to getting into that. Let's do it. Yeah, right, let's get rolling. We're going to start our brew news with uh, Mr. Ryan Reynolds. Mr. And Deadpool himself. Mr. Deadpool himself. And Rob McElhenney. I don't know how to say it, guys. I'm sorry, all of you Sunny fans. I should know how to say it, but I don't. It's McElhenney. Always to massacre and mispronounce it. There are many. McElhenney. It's McElhenney. 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 If there was doubt, now there won't be any. It's McElhenney. They purchased the Wrexham Lager Brewery, which is like one of the oldest breweries in all of the UK, correct? Excuse me. Yeah, I believe so. Remembering that correctly? Uh, part of what they're doing is selling off uh, some of their ownership from their soccer club. Yeah. Uh, taking that investment and then investing into the brewery, trying to combine the worlds together and also get uh, the Rex and Lager into the U.S. and more like worldwide. In Canada, in yeah. Canada. Um, so it's an interesting like flip-flop, right? Like I feel like they didn't, they bought the soccer team not that long ago. Really kind of ramped it up with their stardom, which helped. Started winning more games. They're still not like a top-notch crazy good team, but improved. Mm-hmm. And now they're selling it off to a family that really knows the soccer world. They know the team. Uh, I guess they know the family fairly well, so they think it's in very good hands. <laughs> Football is life, Capitan. Mm-hmm. Hopefully able to like kind of take the team to the next level. And then decide to use that investment to keep investing within the community and kind of growing upon itself. And they chose beer. Weird. It's like soccer and beer go together. It's like they go together. There's also been a lot of soccer celebrities jumping sports. into the beer world. It yeah. is kind of by low. Profit. It, exactly. There's a little bit of that happening, but yeah, yeah. And there's there's a handful. So uh kind of a cool, interesting juggle. I'll be interested to see how that pans out long run. Um excited to see Rob back and the bar again because that only makes sense. And see uh, <laughs> what is uh what is what they're gonna do with that. Yeah. Um, well, it was unexpected, I think is why I like this. Actually, I, wasn't um, expecting that I think I think you hit the nail on the head about um uh, buying low. Um beer has always been around, beer's never gonna go anywhere. You know, this is part of that. I think just having your fingers in as many pies as you can as far as the investment world is concerned. And then they're actually with the New York State family, you know, it's part of an additional like joint venture. Right. So there's other angel investors, venture couples, whatever, buying into it. Um, So to me, I think I think you hit the nail on the head in that aspect. And it's an opportunity for them to expand their portfolio. And hey, I think we all know if you're a sports fan, beer often goes hand you in hand. Probably like a beer. Yeah, yeah, you probably like a beer, yeah, or mean, you appreciate uh, what it does for sports. I mean, yeah, if they can get it into more of the stadiums and exactly, I mean, you talked about beer being around forever. This brewery has been around since 1882. Yeah, a long time, like a long, long time. time. So I guess we can't say it's one of the oldest. I think it's one of the oldest lager breweries. Yeah, because yeah. There's been it's, know, yeah, that's like, what it is. Monk brewery is around for way longer than that. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's and definitely a lager breweries. brewery yeah. um, in the UK. And lagers are back on the ramp up, you know what I mean? So we did do a whole uh, episode about years of lager. lager so, so yeah. check that out. Um, and and if, you know, if those lagers are good and they can get here just as good, I'm in for it. Like, I, um, I love European beer. They're always so freaking good. There's a lot of good brewers over there yeah, for sure. It's so clean, mm. good water. So, anyways, there's a lot of good water. That's a big part of it. Interesting Um, piece. So, that's kind of the upside of the finance and economic theme of the Bruise News. Bruise News. The bee's knees. Um, 
but so the next one is is the downside and we'll, we'll talk about exits a little bit we're talking about Molson Coors and if you recall back in August they were in the news for um, basically selling off four, yeah. four different craft breweries uh, oh, articles in the link you can read all about it they yeah. sold to this Canadian cannabis company so they can you know buy low and get into the beer game in that regard right so that's their acquisition but the exit for Molson Coors is offloading these and and they did so because basically they're like hey we want to focus on Blue Moon and Lion and Kugel yeah and it's like okay totally legit yeah. get it it's November now they're shutting down Lion and Kugel's uh the the original brew house yeah in wisconsin yeah i think so i like i'm not 100 percent sure but uh, i think it's the original yeah um, and i'm sure it's the like combined it's like forces, 150 years old but yeah into the same like brew house and right and basically they're just streamlined. they're just downsizing consolidating yeah. it, it's about efficiency right yeah. but uh feels bad um you know i i did see an article this morning that i think it's something like 50 some people will lose their jobs because mm. of it i actually thought it would be more yeah. um i was thinking in the hundreds now that's not to take away from the 50 people that are losing their jobs because that's yeah, absolutely never any fun um but maybe they'll find a way to stay within the company so so yeah. the idea is here is what we're highlighting is that there's these acquisitions and exits taking place and these economics are constantly ups and downs and roller coasters you're yeah. buying low trying to sell high when you can and hopefully not lose your ass in the meantime yeah. um the other, the other thing i think is kind of cool about it is me. because of where the market is and how things are changing and you're seeing like i, I think about uh the tivoli right they were like we're gonna like triple down on was it mile high uh, the they, outlaw the outlaw outlaw lager is actually right over there because they wanted to start competing against Coors and bud light exactly right? because they're they're yeah. going down but there's kind of this middle ground size of breweries that like i feel like the really small craft breweries are struggling a bit the really big breweries are struggling a bit but kind of these like medium big size have some market to grab is kind of the feeling i'm getting that people That's a good are, point are like, you know what? Like, I do want a different... I also want a lager, mm -hmm. but I want, like, a different lager. I want a rice lager. Yeah, and so, like, to get new, fresh faces into the space, like, I think of the Kelsey Brothers with the the uh, garage beer, mm -hmm. right? You've got these guys getting into the lager space now. You've got Tivoli jumping into the lager space. Like, it's just, like, this interesting shift that I think there's... That medium-sized brewery is trying to grab some of that lager space because it's open right now. And I think that's cool. I think that helps shake up the space. I think it it just freshens it freshens it up a bit. It freshens it up. It's also inevitable, right? Like big often prevails while small guys fall off, even if they yeah. have been around for 10, 15 years. But that's not to say, uh, you know, like line and Kugels, if you've been around for 150 years or so, it doesn't mean that you won't some succumb to some sort of efficiency standard. Yeah. Yeah, consolidation and like over COVID, it kind of like, just is what it is, and we're in such a big, yeah, it's such a roller coaster turning point, and and that's, who knows where and that's we go. interesting because the over COVID, like those medium sized breweries really struggled mm -hmm. because like they were buying enough that they they weren't had like especially with cans, right? Like they weren't able to buy that huge, massive, big bulk, right? That was getting their prices cut down. Right. But on the flip, like they're buying enough ingredients, but still not enough to get the price. Like they were kind of in that middle ground of not being able to either have space or afford the big price cuts. And with everything going up, they were really hurting. Sure. But they also seem to be getting away from the craft beer model in these medium size and instead are going, let's rock out these loggers mm -hmm. and focus on that more. Not being that medium to big size or bigger size brewery that's like, we offer 15 different flavors like it kind of seems like they're like let's leave that to the craft beer space which i think is great yeah and it also in theory should open up shelf space for more craft beers right so, so. i was just gonna say like let's talk about distribution a little bit like yeah. we've heard from cody and we did hear from sarah you know a couple weeks ago about how they're trying to get back into yeah. distributing whereas before it, it wasn't necessarily a thing for them. They were just doing a lot of to-go options, yeah. it, right? It makes sense, COVID and everything. You want to make sure that you have some sort of canning line so that you can get your beer out there when people can't necessarily be on in, in the establishment. So yeah. now both of them were like, yeah, we're tipping our toe into distributing. Yeah. 
right? So, I mean, some of those what do you think lines, about that? Some of that canning equipment might be, prices might be going down, too. I was wondering the right? same, right? Because, like, a lot of those, like, it's not like Goose Island. It's uh, whoever the goose canning line is. Might just be goose. Um, like, over, I would say in the last five years, started getting that smaller brewery size, like, single head. You could upgrade it, but you're only going to rack out however many cans. Mm -hmm. So it's not really like full blown production, but it was good for these really smaller breweries that either needed in house or doing very small distribution. Right. But it wasn't this huge canning line. And so, of course, those prices are going to be really high because they're new. So I'm wondering if those prices are coming down. And in addition, less people going out, getting into the tap room. But apparently there's still enough sales going on that that's going to probably offset some of the people not getting into the tap rooms. Right. And But you also brought up, you know, opportunities for open shelf space. So, okay. I, I mean, it, um, it would be interesting, you know, um, how liquor stores and, are opening up those shelf spaces as well. Grocery stores, et cetera. Because yeah. um, I heard a lot about canning, not necessarily about kegging anything off and getting more into tap rooms, which they still might be. Yeah. Um, but it was definitely more focus on those uh, canning lines and, yeah. and just having the option available. So just yeah. curious. Yeah. I don't know. I haven't heard a whole lot of the keg distribution. The biggest thing I know is like I've heard forever is the prices are just so hard to lock in. Yeah. Like for old Chicago or any of those big tap rooms, right? Like the reason they have those medium size and up brews is because their prices are just so much lower. Right. When, yeah. when a brewery is going in and they're like, Hey, it's, 150 to 200 dollars a keg and they're still barely making good margins on it and they have to drive it around and they have to have a salesperson hired where you know coors can come in and be like hey fill up like six of these draft lines i'll sell it to you for six or like 50 bucks a keg right right. from from the other business perspective it's nearly a no-brainer even though that might not be like what they want to do it's just hard to justify that massive price difference and okay again if you can't get the price cuts you're a small brew house. I mean, the biggest eye opener thing that I had was like to brew a big brew, three barrel versus seven versus fifteen versus twenty. For the most part, it takes pretty close to the same amount of time. Yeah, but if you have a three barrel and you need to get to twenty, that's a lot of brews to get to twenty. Yeah. It's like seven, you know what I mean? And yeah. it's eight dollars, eight hours of brew. Yeah, that hmm. just like hours wise isn't feasible to be doing that. So. Hmm. Yeah, I like it. Interesting. So that's what's in the news. There's stuff. there's a lot of other articles out there. Um, closures happening, acquisitions occurring, exits, what, whatever you want to call it, right? I mean, it's a constant conversation. We don't always highlight. I feel like we do and we don't highlight um, acquisitions and closures, depending on kind of where it's at in the world, how it yeah. hits the heart, where it hits the home, all of that. But um it's a special episode to highlight it because of our theme of public offerings. So that was fun to do. I wouldn't say like no one has ever applauded me for my financial skills. So like, but I, but I like considering um, the economics of things, right? Yeah. Um, uh, supply chain, distribution, feasibility, Time management, cost, yeah. bottom line, cost based price scenario. Like, th- those are fun conversations to have. They can become exhausting, but uh, some people make a whole life out of them. And I think it's, um, it's cool to consider, yeah. As- especially when you do have bigger name, like celebrities more and more coming into the scene. Obviously, they have a passion for it or some sort of connection to it, or else they wouldn't do it. Right. But, yeah. and, there is still money there is the point that I'm trying to make. And there's still passion and interest. Yeah. I mean, even a lot of the stuff I saw, breweries in general, still have a margin on them. The The bigger difference is they hit more of the restaurant margins, which is like five to maybe 10% if you're having like a really crushing month. Like okay. there's just not huge margins on them. Yeah. Where for a lot of years there, it was 30, 50, 60% margins. Yeah. And so I think just a lot of breweries and don't have the budget and the financial know-how to adjust for those differences Mm -hmm. based on their own models or adjusting prices or the amount that they were brewing. Like there's a lot of variables that go into play within that, that I just think it's not a, it's not a market you can't make a living on. You can pay your bills with it for sure. It's just how much are you going to have left over and how much did you 
up your lifestyle when you were making 50% margins <laughs> versus Good point. 5% margins, right? Like Good your point. lifestyle might not still Good apply point. to it because that's kind of what happened. So that being said, right, a lot more reason why then you're coming back to seeing a lot more of your owners and your head brewers behind the bar again. It's, um, it's not so much the conversation as in this short staff type of thing, like not necessarily that don't, people don't want to work. I'm not saying that's not still a thing, but like you have to because yeah. it's, it's more of that mom and pop mentality because you, you are more so buried to married to the business. It's not this passive income because you're getting yeah. that 30 to 50 percent. Definitely and a lot more. So I'm picking up, picking up what you're putting out, which is cool, right? Because yeah. we're getting more of these ethos and origin stories coming out because yeah. they're there and we can have that conversation. And, and which is why community and collaboration comes up more and more because the community becomes even more and more tight knit to. Yeah be part of it be together. involved be around yeah, yeah exactly craft, it, ta- it takes right? a village and it's also craft but i mean like it's craft like it's to me it's like kind of meant to be that way right like you don't have a ma and pa shop that has an, an absentee owner it just doesn't make sense yeah where craft is, was at least for a long time kind of had that ma and pa type of vibe but then it became more like corporate money focused had these absentee owners and just people yeah. that are working yeah and I think that's what we're kind of losing yeah. out of it. Yeah. And, so, and gaining back. And gaining back yeah. in different ways. 